Welcome, everyone. I just wanted to briefly introduce myself and welcome you all to the Washington, D.C. Economic Partnership. So uh, the partnership is your go-to spot for growing your business or bringing your business to D.C. So we're so glad that you're here. And some of the things that we do here include those great publications out just beyond, you might not have seen them because it was just beyond the beer and the wine, but they're great publications. Look through those. They have everything you need to know about where your business should be moving, what you should do to start your business, and uh, have a, a lot of great demographic information and also just general business resources. So definitely pick some of those up on your way out. If you have any questions about site location assistance or about any of the programs that we're doing here at the partnership, definitely let Tiffany or myself know. And I just want to introduce Dan Kunitz, who is the chairman of Accelerate DC and also the director of the DC i program. I'll keep this real short. Um, is this on? Yeah. Um, so who here is an entrepreneur? Raise your hand if you're an entrepreneur. Raise your hand if you're a mentor, if you mentor entrepreneurs. Raise your hand if you do both. Nice. Once an entrepreneur, always one, right? Uh, and I guess there's a few others in the crowd also. All right, so um, we work with aspiring entrepreneurs here in Accelerate DC and being an entrepreneur is about taking risks, getting out of your comfort zone. And so venturing out on a 15 degree night uh, to hear some people talk is a good first step. Uh, those of you who are committed and meeting each other, I uh, really welcome you here. Uh, glad that you could all make it. So the core program at Accelerate DC is a mentoring program. We've been around for almost two, or exactly two years actually. Um, and we mentor early stage technology startups. Uh, and those engagements that we have with the technology startups are very hands-on, one-to-one. We really want to get to know people. We want to get to know what you're doing, what your challenges are, and how we can help you. And this program has uh, really gotten an awful lot of traction. Uh, and we're really, really pleased with how we've grown over the last couple of years. These events are a great chance for us to broaden our view a little bit, meet more people from the community. Uh, so you get to learn a bit about us and we get a broader reach to learn about you guys. So look forward to hopefully uh, throughout this program we'll get some chances to hear a little bit about what your concerns are, what your challenges are, um, and how we can help. But I encourage you to read up more about our program uh, and learn a little more about Accelerate DC's core offerings. And with that, I'm going to introduce Mike, who is going to be the moderator um, uh, for our four panelists here. Uh, and so a lot of these folks here are mentors in our program, and they really uh, volunteer an awful lot of their time. So I want to thank all of you for coming, uh, for taking your time to, to speak. These are all very accomplished entrepreneurs. You have a lot to learn from them. Um, and a quick introduction for Mike. Um, so Mike is, an aero, by trade, an aerospace engineer. Uh, school, right? training. school training, right, briefly. But nonetheless, I think that makes you a rocket scientist. Um, and so <laughs> as, a, as a mentor, if he tells you what you're doing is not rocket science, he knows what he's talking about, right? All right, so his first company was Infomech, which was bootstrapped, uh, had grew to over 100 employees in the e-commerce space. He's the past president and global board member of Entrepreneurs Organization, EO. Mike's an Army veteran, company commander after 9-11, and the founder of Mission Entrepreneur, uh, which we've partnered on a couple events here at Accelerate DC with that uh, excellent group. They encourage uh, military veterans to become entrepreneurs. Any military veterans here? Great. And um, recently jumped into a new startup that we've talked about a little bit called Mini Roots uh, in the agritech space, changing the way that people get their food. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike, and I'll let you introduce the rest of the folks on the team. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Um, I'll stand up just to introduce, and I guess I'll sit down because I'm a panelist too here. So I'm just going to introduce uh, Sabod. And uh, you guys should have the bio. It's actually I tweeted out the bios before. I don't know if you saw that, Erica, but it's out there. But uh, my take on after talking to Sabo and getting to know him is he's really he's a serial entrepreneur, but he's also a, a big uh, juggler in multiple ways, right? Uh, which I take as a badge of honor because I until recently I was a big juggler of multiple things too, of big data analytics. You've got a company that's uh, multiple locations and lots of different business models. I think I read you had nine different companies. Is that right? So that's why we're sitting together. We we, we get along on <laughs> a lot of things, I think. But the uh, interesting fact is you're launching a, because uh, I asked everybody to give us one thing that they've done that nobody else in the room has done. So if anybody says something to that question that somebody here has done, raise your hand and we'll, we'll, we'll freestyle and find something else. But your, your takeaway for your one thing was what? I decided to launch uh, two companies at two ends of 
the, of Latin America, one in Panama, one in Brazil, with a Portuguese billing company and uh, two completely different business models and two completely different regulatory environments at the same time. Um, I wouldn't recommend that. We'll get to the war story in a second. Do you call that Babel? Tower of Babel? <laughs> um, but I think that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I, I mean, just uh, managing that's uh, unusual. And then I also want to introduce Tim. And Tim, I, I, my description of you would be uh, political experience, but also a young, I'd call you a young gun, uh, which I used to call myself that back when I was younger. But uh, he's got a uh, really uh, high growth company you guys have probably all heard about called Fiscal Note. And um, the unusual thing that you're going to share, do you want to sign off with that? Uh, yeah. So. Um, you know, we started our company in Silicon Valley about two and a half years ago, and uh, while a lot of entrepreneurs go the other way, we actually brought our company and moved our headquarters from Silicon Valley here to uh, Washington, D.C., um, and we did that. <laughs> right on. You brought a lot of guys like Mark Cuban and uh, you know, some Inkelvoss twins and some other people that are really pretty cool. Can hang out in D.C. a little more now, right? Uh, and then we've got Amita, and Amita is... Uh, Interesting, because she's a yoga instructor. I'm going to throw that one out there first. Anybody else here a yoga instructor? Okay. I thought that might be the one shot that, that we had yeah, for, no, for a tie. safe one thing I picked. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then uh, you, you're, a, I'd say, a thought leader in the, the health space. Uh, you're an entrepreneur, but you basically came from the uh, investor side, uh, the investor world. And she's also an author, and she's brought several books, which I think we should have enough today. I think the cold kept a couple of books at home. So it's called Enduring Edge. And it's pretty cool, so check it out if you can. Um, so afterwards, you'll be signing them, right? Yeah, so you come up, have her sign them, and they'll become a lot more valuable, too. <laughs> so uh, that's pretty much it for the introductions. Um, I guess uh, for me, uh, my one thing is, anybody else in the room have a parachute collapse on them? No? You? That's all right. uh, well, it's not fun, but it, it reinflated after I fell a little bit faster. Um, OK. so. <laughs> And I told the story to Bode earlier, and he's like, so your golden parachute was, I'm trying to do your accent, I shouldn't do that. Your golden parachute didn't inflate? And I was like, no, no, it was a real parachute. It's okay, I had a rifle in my leg, though, so. Um, yeah, right, and three seconds to react. Um, and then, I, I, of course, uh, Dan introduced me already, but um, I'm, my passion and my focus is on uh, a startup called uh, Mini Roots, and uh, missionentrepreneur.org is something I encourage you all to go check out. That's where we're helping vets. We've already helped 200 vets start up. Uh, I know some of you guys have helped with uh, what we're doing. But uh, check it out. And if you know any vets that want to start a business, send them to missionentrepreneur.org. So uh, why don't we go into the war stories here? I'm going to sit down. So, Bo, I'm going to call on you first. Uh, maybe kind of share uh, your stories. So uh, my name is Sabod Nair. I have uh, the dubious distinction of starting nine businesses. I started my first one when I was 15 when I looked around and said, you know what? I want to watch videos. There's no place to rent videos. What if I went to a liquor store and set up a video distributor there and so I could rent videos when people buy liquor? I made a lot of money. Paid, made people go through school. And then I went to school and I said, you know what? It's really hard to buy tickets and go anywhere in the world. And so how do I do that? So I went to this startup called BT, British Telecom. And I said, uh, and I at this point was 19, 20, something like that. Younger than him, but less successful. Um, so I, I went to BT and I said, you've got this amazing system of it's pre-internet. What if I stood up, um, uh, uh, you know, you connect to every travel agent in, in the United Kingdom. What if I set up a tool set that allowed every travel agent in the United Kingdom to buy tickets and sell them at a discount? This is pre the internet, this is pre travel loss, this is pre all of this. Did that, made a boatload of money. And then put in another business that I'll leave un unnamed and lost every single penny. So I decided I need to go to work for a living, uh, and I did. And then I, after a few years, I thought I couldn't deal with this anymore, and I started a series of businesses around um, the smart grid. So if you guys have ever heard of the smart grid, it's uh, the management of the electric network to uh, make it more efficient. And I started this business, and, and then I thought, you know, why would any electricity util electric utility want to lose energy? Why would you want to do that? And discovered to my great cost that they want to lose energy because if they lose energy they can make money on it and so I pivoted and that therein begins my story 
Um, so I pivoted and I found that these guys wanted to figure out how to lose money. And so I started a consulting business and, and an analytics business and built this uh, pretty large organization and I was making great returns and I didn't see the environment change. So my, my war story is it's really easy to pivot when things aren't going well. It's really, it's, you know, as this isn't working, I need to change. This hurts, I need to stop. It's extremely difficult to build a product, build your minimum viable product, and then sell that same product and not allow scope creep. So I would say across, and I never learned my lesson. Um, you know, I, I uh, eventually decided that I couldn't um, keep learning that lesson, so I, I thought I was going to stop, and then I went to... Um, the company I'm with now, Watersmart. And I went to Watersmart, I've known them for a long time, and I said, um, you know, you guys, you guys are just, you're totally screwing the pooch, excuse me. You're not executing well on the East Coast. <laughs> and they said, you're right. So why don't you help us build the business and we're gonna call the East Coast anything east of Chicago. Because they're a San Francisco-based company and it's, you know, it's all just out there. So now I'm with Watersmart, and once again, I am trying to build a business. In, although it's nice to be venture-backed, it's nice to have all the resources that, that uh, Watersmart does. I'm trying to build a business that starts in Chicago and ends in Atlanta and goes up to Maine. It's 140 million people, something south of 330,000 potential customers. And, oh, just in case I was bored, also designing a new product that we have to sell in this market because on the East Coast, starting in Chicago, people are less concerned about saving water. We're more concerned about getting rid of the storm water. So it's, again, uh, you know, I, I haven't learned my lesson, and I'm more than happy to acknowledge that I hope, in, in sharing that with you, um, I'm hoping that you'll learn the lesson that once you figure out what you want to sell, stick with it, once you figure out what it is you want to do, execute on that flawlessly, and don't allow scope creep to happen. With that, I'm going to turn over to and cede my remaining two minutes to somebody who's executing flawlessly. <laughs> so I would, I would, I don't know about executing flawlessly, but I will uh, try and provide some some interesting stories. Um, so my background is is sort of in politics and technology. Uh, you know, was engaged pretty heavily in the Obama 08 campaign and then actually uh, ended up running for office myself and I uh, interestingly served uh, uh, one term up in, uh, on the school board up in Montgomery County, uh, Maryland and did that all before the age of 17 um, and was gunning down the sort of pathway towards thinking about going uh, down the political path, right? I mean, from Washington, from the Washington suburbs area, uh, you know, and that's sort of the, the dream of a lot of folks out here. Um, but I decided I should, I should take a break at, at about 17, 18, and I decided I should go back to college. And so I went to college in, at, at Princeton and was studying computer science and public policy. And uh, my junior year at Princeton was uh, tapped out of a policy organization in Washington. Um, and so I was commuting back and forth between New Jersey and D.C. Um, and was trying to essentially um, run a staff of, of some folks who were tasked with writing um, a lot of briefs around a bunch of different issues going on at the time. So everything from ACA implementation, Pell Grant reform, immigration reform. Um, and one of the biggest challenges that I had was that uh, it was actually incredibly difficult to actually go understand what's going on in government at any given time. So um, as you can probably imagine here in Washington, even if you live in Washington, it's hard for you to stay in the know. Um, there's Congress, clearly, um, but you have uh, thousands of federal agencies. Um, now you venture past the Beltway and you have uh, 50 state legislatures, you have 3,000 city halls, you have um, you know, over tens of thousands of different utilities and insurance and agricultural uh, commissions and, and regulatory agencies. So if you're a business operating in America, uh, there's a tsunami of regulations and legislation that you need to continue to stay on top of around the country. Um, and you need to do that in real time. And so the traditional way of getting information has been traditionally through K Street lobbying firm, or a law, uh, law firm, or trade association. And we decided we could actually automate all of that. Um, so we built, um, initially, a search algorithm that went off into the internet and actually scraped information 
trying to aggregate legislation regulations from around the web and do it in real time and then apply NLP and uh, artificial intelligence to be able to come out with interesting analytics around those laws. So we can look at, for example, the forecasts of how likely a bill is to pass or using sentiment analysis to be able to understand the sentiment of regulators and their enforcement actions um, or looking at court cases and the potential outcomes of litigation in the future. And so um, essentially the, the business of mitigating legal and government risk is actually <coughs> Uh, incredibly lucrative here in Washington and actually it's the sort of business of Washington for the last couple of centuries and so um, we decided there might be a massive opportunity and uh, certainly a massive opportunity to actually disrupt a very very old and stodgy industry um, so the first challenge that we had was that when I had this idea I was 21 years old um, and I was just coming out of my junior year at Princeton um, and we had no money so what we did is we essentially tried to bootstrap as much as possible asking our uh, parents and friends, uh, you know, trying to do uh, whatever we could. So we scrapped together about $25,000 and uh, used a good portion of it trying to buy a ticket out to the valley, right? Because if you're a 21-year-old kid who wants to start a company, of course you go to the valley. Um, and so uh, we were in the valley and our first challenge was that we couldn't actually find an apartment. Um, insanely, insanely expensive to actually find an apartment for uh, two buddies of mine who were, we were starting a company with and actually another two engineers that we had brought on. Uh, from high school and so if you can imagine five guys kind of roaming around uh, in Silicon Valley trying to find an apartment that's that was pretty much us for the first week um, and during the time we were actually in a Motel 6 and so what eventually ended up happening was that we actually just camped out in the Motel 6 for about four months um, <laughs> we it was actually cheaper to live in a hotel uh, Motel 6 um, than to actually get an apartment in the valley and so uh, you can kind of visualize this um, you know, I, my co-founder and myself sharing a bed and another two guys sharing a bed and then another guy sleeping on the floor. Um, and so for four months, we were actually living in this room um, trying to build the first prototype of this company. Um, and I can guarantee you, it was, it was not great. I mean, in the mornings, um, you know, we try and take a shower. And so what happened is there's only one bathroom in the Motel 6. And so the, the shower would actually fog up the entire room. And so we'd have to sit there kind of scraping our computer monitors as we coded. Um, <laughs> And uh, which was actually, it was, it was a very fun time. Um, and so, um, you know, the first kind of war story is just that, you know, it, it was incredibly rough. I mean, I, I can't say that it was, it was fun um, all the time. I mean, there, there are times at 1.30 or 2 in the morning where, um, you know, you're, you're sitting there with your friends, you just got out of some big argument on, uh, you know, this feature or the direction of the company, um, the name of the company or the name of a product you're developing. Um, and you're just like, I don't want to do this anymore, right? I mean, there's just, there's so many of those moments in the early stages. Um, like, what are you do, what, what are we doing, like sleeping on the, on the floor, uh, like in a Motel 6, right? And so, um, you know, getting through those periods was actually incredibly rough. And, and um, you know, there's a, there's a happy ending to the story, which is that about four and a half months, five months into the company, uh, we were able to come out with a, a, a pretty breakthrough prototype. Not only were we able to aggregate uh, and search information from all 50 state legislatures, uh, but we actually built an algorithm that was capable of predicting with over 90% accuracy the probability of a bill passing. Um, and that was a major breakthrough for sort of political intelligence and legal risk. Um, and so very quickly, there was a bunch of investors that piled on. Uh, Mark Cuban was certainly the first one, but uh, NEA, um, uh, Jerry Yang, and a couple others. Um, and then we actually, at the time, were getting a lot of interest here on the East Coast. And so we actually moved our company back from the Valley uh, into, D into DC. Um, and we started scaling the company up from there. So that was almost exactly two years ago um, when that happened. And so since then have, have raised uh, an additional about 20 million venture capital, scaled the company to you know, about 100 employees today. Um, and we're servicing everybody from um, uh, you know, pharma, major pharma, healthcare, energy, real estate, financial services, technology, anybody that's heavily, heavily regulated by the government. Um, one of the biggest scares that we had as we were scaling this company was actually the second round of institutional venture capital we were trying to raise. And so at the time, we had about 15, 20 employees on staff. And uh, you know, we were, we were trying to remain super, super scrappy. Uh, and so right before we had raised our Series A, we actually um, were you know, just in the process going through legal due diligence and going through the process. And the day before we were supposed to sign our round of venture capital, uh, the deal fell apart. Um, and when we actually look back at the capital raising that we, we had done, uh, you could actually, it wasn't that difficult to, to realize the signs, right? I mean, our investors were 
Um, not exactly a good cultural fit for us. Um, you know, they didn't necessarily share the same mission and the same values. Um, and one of the biggest things that I had learned uh, over time was that you really have to try and find uh, investors and capital partners. And I, and I say capital partners as a very, very specific term because they are your partners in building the company. Um, and so luckily, um, uh, we were able to kind of patch everything together. But at the time, it was incredibly stressful, right? You had 20 something employees on staff. Um, you know, at the time, we had actually six weeks uh, payroll left in the bank. And so um, after that deal fell apart, I, I grabbed, um, you know, all of our employees, uh, you know, had an all hands meeting. I said, guys, look, um, you know, the deal fell apart, but you have to trust me that we're going to actually get out of it. And so um, actually, the amazing thing to this day that I'm actually thankful for is that our employees, one by one at the time, voluntarily uh, offered to take a pay cut for two months, which actually extended the runway of the company and allowed us to have enough time to go off and raise our, our, our round of capital. But um, the big lesson for us is, you know, number one, pick the right capital partner. But number two, um, the culture of the company is so, so, so important uh, as you're building the organization. And um, it, what, if it wasn't for the cohesiveness and the mission uh, that was driving every single one of our employees at the time, um, I don't think that we would be standing here today with the same company that we have. Uh, and so incredibly grateful to our employees, but um, the big lesson that for me as a first-time entrepreneur was that um, there's, if there's one thing you do not compromise on as a startup CEO, it's picking the right people, maintaining the right culture, and building the organization for the long term. Um, and that's something that, uh, you know, in all the, the ups and downs that we have uh, as a startup every single day in the major customer wins and the um, the churn or some major employee loss, whatever the case is, um, the thing that really con remains consistent is having a great uh, company culture that people want to work for. And that's something that uh, every single day I think about. Wow. I mean, I'm just going to say wow, right? Because you mind if I show your age? Sorry? Do you mind if I show your age? So, you, so you, Tim's 23. Uh, what's, what I'm saying wow is because the story I'm going to tell, I think, follows into that pretty well. Uh, first of all, a lot of people who are in their 40s, 50s, and have been in business for 20 years don't get the culture lesson, how important it is. For, for you to be able to get people to say, hey, you're living in a Motel 6, and uh, guess what? Hang in there for another two months, I'm not going to pay you. I mean, that's, that's a huge testament to what you're able to do. So I'm, I'm impressed, and I think that's really amazing. And I think that's a huge lesson that you're sharing. Um, I guess the tie-in to my story is, um, you know, my first company was reasonably successful. We bootstrapped up, built it up, um, not quite to 100 employees, but then we had contractors, and we had a, a pretty good team. Uh, I had fun with the company until it was about 50 employees, and then it wasn't really that much fun for me. Um, but the reason I, 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 I segue into it is because we were an e-commerce company, and really the core part of what we were doing at Infomac was day in, day out, was looking at totally different business models or some other you know, crazy idea, maybe it's a dot-com or an established old business or a brick and mortar, and trying to put a special twist on it. So I, we'd look at different business models every day. So when I exited Infomec, uh, soon after that, uh, I, I did have a business that, that, that I shut down after that. But basically, I continued for about 10 years. So really, the, uh, the point where you said, I, I guess you were 19, is that right? These are in human years, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, I mean, you're like, I'm going ah, to take some time off and go back and figure out, you know, figure out my life, right? So I had that uh, for about 10 years where I spent my time doing what I was doing at Infomac, basically with other companies. So investing in small service companies, helping them grow, uh, doing some advising, a little bit of angel investing, and, and supporting those folks. Um, but I spent a lot of time doing that. And it wasn't until uh, really kind of what my story's about, this, uh, I'd call it the silver cloud of getting diagnosed with cancer, uh, had kidney cancer, uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, got diagnosed, and and the, the takeaway is it really got me to focus on one thing, right? Um, and I wish I'd been doing it about at least five years earlier, if not ten years earlier, because uh, going from building your own dream that you think can change the world, and with e-commerce, we really were kind of on the cutting edge, and we were making a huge difference, and that was really alive, right? That was awesome. I felt great with that team, even though we were working like crazy, and then it, it just shifting it down to uh, it's kind of like instead of hitting home runs, hitting singles, and that was nowhere near the same. Uh, but as soon as I, I got told, you know, hey, you got multifocal kidney cancer, right? Uh, and at 42, that's pretty young, so they were really surprised by that. Um, and I was basically went into a complete depression, didn't even tell anybody, uh, didn't tell any family members or anybody about it for like about five, six days. It wasn't until 10 days until I started telling some people on my teams. 
I was just completely depressed and, and kind of withdrew. Uh, it wasn't until, I was actually, I was biking. I, my office is about 10 blocks away from where the hospital is. So I was biking away from where I was just told I had uh, cancer. They're going to take one of my kidneys, and they're hoping it wasn't metastasizing. And I got hit by a car. I almost lost his finger. <laughs> so I get thrown, get hit by this car. But the good thing is that's where it, like, got me to, it jolted me awake, right? It maybe basically I got up and was like, I'm going I'm to fight. Uh, the docs I was talking to were not the best in the world. Uh, so I went out and found the best of the best. Uh, I popped up pop flares. Reached out to a lot of other entrepreneurs I know, which everybody here is starting businesses. You ought to reach out through uh, Accelerate DC. Uh, there's groups like EO or YPO. You really need to reach out to them uh, because it wasn't until I started popping those flares and saying, I got a problem, guys. I need help. Boom, they came in with huge introductions. I got phone calls answered a lot faster than I thought I would and got the right team solving it. But I had six months where I didn't know it was going to happen, right? So the silver cloud. I call it a silver cloud with a dark lining, right? I call it a silver cloud because it, it did make me focus, right? Really two things. One was uh, figuring out my family situation and two, really having a business that I think could touch a billion people. And uh, I didn't think I could do that in six months. I, if I'd talked to you, maybe I would have maybe I, I would have changed my, uh, my uh, attack a little bit. But uh, I had six months, so I, I, that's when we started this thing called Mission Entrepreneur and got a whole bunch of people who were volunteers, loved the idea of helping veterans start a business and in six months, we had two major events, helped 200 vets start companies or help them you know, be more successful, really had a lot of impact, positive stories. And that was great. Uh, but my, my, the concept was, I want to do something I love. I want to do something that's huge, that impacts a lot of people, right? Um, and, and I guess that's my takeaways. If you can, don't wait till you're getting a uh, uh, cancer diagnosis or something awful that happens before you get into that, I want to solve a big problem. Figure out the biggest thing you can swing for uh, and go out there, something you're passionate about, and make it work. So for like five years, I was gardening at home, right? I had some home urban gardening stuff that I really liked. It was zen, it was peaceful, it was really cool. I was, I'm an engineer, as, uh, as Dan mentioned, so I'd actually designed some products, but it was always a hobby, right? I was always taking a back seat to all this other stuff I was doing. And so, you know, two years after I designed this little smart garden thing, boom, there's a smart garden product out there, not mine. So I was, I was noticing that, and then as soon as I realized, hey, as soon as I survive, uh, get through this, you know, there's pretty good chance I'd make it through, uh, okay chance I'd make it without aggressive chemo. I'm going all in on this uh, one thing, which is why I started Many Roots. Uh, and the, the whole idea behind Many Roots is to make it so that everybody in the world can on average eat at least one meal a day that's hyper locally grown, right? With, means grown within five minutes of where they work, live, or play. There's a whole lot of, th whole lot of things that, that impacts um, about 60 to 75% of the cost of food are directly related to transportation and pollutants and all that other crazy stuff. But it's also just a really good dynamic. If people grow, the self-reliance, the whole idea of people growing together, I really get charged out of that. And uh, it is a big problem. And there's some cool stuff we're doing. You know, I'm, I'm, I focused in on passion. Uh, you know, where's the big need? What am I good at? Right? I'm pretty good at tech. I'm pretty good at collaborative technologies and things like that and different business models. And what can you be the best in the world at? So Mini Roots has really coalesced around this concept that I came up with called crowd cropping to basically help people garden collaboratively together and then get food from that whole ecosystem. But uh, it's a big problem. Uh, I think we're on to at least one thing that's gonna change, change the way people garden and the way people eat food and connect. But I, I guess the thing is I feel way more alive now than I did you know, 18 months ago. And it was really dark for about two, two weeks and then for that six months I, had, I was distracted purposefully on Mission Entrepreneur, uh, which is great. But now that I made it through, I'm focusing on what I wish I'd been focusing on five, ten years ago. So that, that's my takeaway is a war story. I, you know, I lost, I'd say I lost five years. Um, so don't lose it. Push yourself to be big. Um, and we got a good friend, Mark Moses, who always says, that, you know, uh, think big, act big, and you'll be big. That's his, that's his whole shtick, and it's really, it's really real. Um, so I encourage you all to do that and reach for a huge problem that can change the world and try to solve it. So on that note, <clears throat> I'm going to pass it over to, to Amita. She's made a bit of a study of doing all that stuff a lot faster without risking your life or, uh, I guess, taking a whole six months off to go back to college. <laughs> so, Amita, can you take us through your thoughts on this? Thank you. You know, Mike, that's an incredibly inspirational story because, you know, a lot of us face um, setbacks in life, but not all of us 
are able to pivot them into something as incredible as what you've done. And I think it's really testament. You know, I think one of the themes you're probably seeing emerge here is that, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, it, it really enters your blood. It's a part of your DNA. And um, whether it is cancer or, you know, figuring out the next step in your life, I think you begin to bring, bring that entrepreneurial spirit to anything and everything you do. And I've seen that, um, you know, over and over again, where, you know, the same challenges are faced by an entrepreneur, and they'll take a term illness but treat it like a startup they're like fine no one's no one's tackled this before but so what you know I it's, no one's tackled a lot of things before no one had tackled what you had before um, so that's you know that's I think part of the story here that um, just because it hasn't been done before um, you know the fear of it can often hold us back but what have you got to lose? Um, so I, I would say that's one of the themes. So, um, you know, my, my story is a bit roundabout and I'll try and make it pretty short so we have plenty of time um, for questions because that's really, I think, the most fun part of this. Um, but I too, um, not by choice necessarily, got entrepreneurship into my blood at a very young age. Um, so I'm a first generation immigrant and my parents moved here from India when I was 14 years old. So I was just entering high school and um, we came here, you know, it was a classic immigrant story. We came here with nothing. They were scientists and they said, you know, they believed in the American dream. They said, we'll go there, we'll start a company. And the first company they started, it completely fell apart. You know, the, the, one of the partners walked out of it who was also the funding for the company. So I saw at a very young age, you know, sort of, I would say, the depths of what can go wrong in an entrepreneurial journey. And my parents, I remember these late night conversations, they were thinking, you know, what do we do? Do we move back to India? Or do we stay here and sort of build up from the ashes again? And to their credit, you know, um, they really perfected the art of bootstrapping, one might say. And, you know, they started another company. And I, um, you know, throughout high school, I spent a lot of my time working in their company. What I was doing was not glamorous or glorious. It was mostly, you know, pasting address labels on marketing mailers, typing in you know, addresses into databases, all of the mundane stuff that a high schooler can do. Um, sometimes I would attend trade shows with them, but it really gave me a very intimate feeling of, you know, I would be standing at a trade show and my dad, who's a scientist, would be explaining a product and then I would see that, you know, someone decided to buy his invention. And that was incredibly inspirational for me and I, you know, learned a lot. Um, but I have to confess, you know, when you're in, when you're in high school, you're, you're not that interested in doing these things I was doing. Um, I was also babysitting. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's sort of a different standard for what one does in high school. But I have to confess, you know, a lot of my peers, they were in these really interesting um, summer programs. They were preparing for college. I didn't know if we could afford college, um, so I was sort of thinking on a very different plane and spent a lot of time sort of just working in the office and babysitting my sister. So I really saw it as mundane, mind-numbing, and sort of felt like I was at a disadvantage, you know, not having the resources and the networks. But it's, you know, that's really my first war story. It happened to me at a very young age, but I think it has convinced me forever um, you know, of the power of entrepreneurship and of the power of not underestimating your own story. And that's really, you know, what happened to me. So I, in my college admissions and my business school application and then my, you know, sort of second job interview after business school, always told the story. And every time, every time the person on the other end saw something in that story that I hadn't seen, they said, wow, that's incredible. You got all of this experience at a young age. So it opened three remarkable doors for me, you know, a first generation immigrant coming here with nothing that really convinced me of the power of, you know, believing in your dream and running um, with it. So all these years later, you know, I went to, I, I was at Harvard for undergrad, thought I would become a doctor, um, changed my mind. It was the first dot-com bubble, started a dot-com with a friend, that went bust, which is a whole another story, but that's for another day. Um, then went off to business school, I was at Stanford, and while I was there, I met someone who had just finished a summer internship at NEA, which is... Um, a very large venture capital firm based out of DC and Silicon Valley. They have um, 17 billion or so in committed capital now. So I, you know, by coincidence, happened to be having lunch with him. He said, oh, we've just hired a partner who's looking for someone. And I think my entrepreneurial experiences at a young age sort of, you know, 
became a big part of our conversation. I had one interview and I was hired. Um, so I, you know, spent then nine years in venture capital, and that's where I really say, you know, venture capital really makes you an expert at failure. Um, you are surrounded by failure. Um, you, you essentially, you know, earn badge after badge of experience and failure. But of course now most sort of active VCs will not spend a lot of their time talking about it. I left that world a few years ago so I can share with you much more openly that, you know, it's, um, you, you screen thousands of business plans. Um, you take dozens of meetings and then you invest in a handful or so of companies. And even then, you know, only a minority, a small proportion of those companies will be really great investments. So everything you've done, most of what you've spent your time on are either ideas that you evaluate and you decide are not worth investing in or teams and entrepreneurs you meet where you're not convinced we can build a company. Or, you know, even after you've invested in you, you make your bets, um, things fall apart. What kinds of things fall apart? I mean, I've, I've, I've really seen it all and I write about some of this in my book, which I'll get to, but you know, if you have deals implode at the last minute, not just financing deals, but acquisition deals. You have management teams fall apart. I, I always say, I think I saw more companies um, implode over management team conflict. And, you know, I would reemphasize re the point around culture, you know, why it's so important. Because when you don't have the right culture, you often have conflict, and that can drive a company to the ground. Um, Markets change overnight. You know, you are you have competitors come up, so you really have an opportunity. I think if you decide to take it to explore um, failure and to really understand and study it. So the next chapter of my life um, really evolved out of that. Um, when I was so my field of focus is healthcare, and I invested in healthcare companies, and I was always curious. Um, about sort of contrarian trends I would observe. And, and let me give you an example. Um, so I often had entrepreneurs come in and they would say, hey, you know, we're focused on the multi-billion dollar for diabetes. And you know, we, we know that diet and exercise work, but they're not effective, people are not doing it. So here's our latest and greatest proprietary patented pill. And you know, then I would listen to the pitch on the pill, look at the data, and this, the story plays out over and over again for a lot of chronic diseases, which was an area that I focused on quite a bit. And I was always left wondering, you know, when we have something proprietary and cutting edge, we will invest a lot of time, a lot of resources, and a lot of dollars into it. But, but why have we, at least you know, in the ecosystem I was in, why, why do we so easily dismiss diet and exercise? Um, and what, what if we looked at the behavior change more? Um, so that's you know, one of the things where you know, entrepreneurs would often say, this is how things are broken and this is how we will fix it. And I always was felt, you know, I was always left feeling, well, the thing itself might be, you, know, you can fix it at the root cause, perhaps. Um, another example, a quick one I'll give you is, you know, sometimes we invested tens of millions of dollars into clinical trials and the trial would fail. It would fail not because the drug didn't work, but because the sugar pill that we compared it to worked just as well. So that's you know, another one of these, it's a failure. The pharmaceutical industry, you know, it's the bane of clinical trials, these placebo effects that we see. But I was left wondering, wait a minute, we, we can give people a sugar pill with no side effects and it's actually working and we're just dismissing this as a nuisance? Isn't, isn't there a lesson in that failure? What, what can we do to act? Can we in, I know we can't invest in sugar pills, but could we invest in something that you know, effectively harnessed um, that phenomenon? Um, so the, you know, it was a lot of themes like that, that that always caught my attention. And I think a lot of it was because I was also seeing you know, this cutting edge research in neuroscience about neuroplasticity and epigenetics, B both incredibly exciting fields that suggest you know, our mind is actually much more malleable than we have traditionally believed, and not just in terms of what we think, but in terms of how we think about the world. Um, so I was really... Um, inspired and convinced that I wanted to study this. I wanted to understand the mind, which is not a trivial undertaking. But I felt that you know a lot of the, the world that I was in was focused much more on drugs and devices and diagnostics. And I really wanted to take those very rigorous, very analytical, methodical approaches and apply them to this whole other world of prevention and wellness and mind-body. Um, so how do you go about this? Um, I, I wasn't sure. Um, you know, I, I 
the vision was clear in my mind and knew exactly where I wanted to get to, sort of developing you know, a more credible way of accessing a lot of what I had observed in terms of you know, well-being originating in the mind. I had also observed that the mindsets of the most successful entrepreneurs, the serial entrepreneurs, the ones who could do it over and over again, or you know, the great investors, the ones who seem to have you know, hit after hit after hit, that there was something different in their minds. They were looking at the world differently. They were operating at a different mental plane. So that too was a state of mind I was really interested in studying and understanding better. So I decided to, you know, I left venture capital um, and I was debating a lot, you know, how do I go about this? And this is maybe, you know, one of my sort of lessons or, you know, stories from that process. Um, I was coming up with a lot of solutions and I said, oh, I could raise a venture capital fund that focuses just on wellness and prevention. You know, there, there were some big companies that seemed to be interested in the space. Then I thought, oh, well, maybe I should start a company that sells nutraceuticals or functional foods. So I started exploring this whole world of wellness. And then it hit me one day that, you know, all of the solutions I was generating were coming out of my nine years of, you know, well-honed thinking. So I was, while I had changed the theme of what I wanted to innovate on, I hadn't really changed. I wasn't really thinking out of the box. I was still confined to venture funded or startup or this or that. So I decided to, I said, you know, if I want to think differently, if I want to really change my mind in terms of how it thinks about solving this very difficult problem, a very big problem, I have to completely change how I'm approaching it. So that's where the yoga teacher training program came in. I said, okay, what is a world as different as the one I've been in all these years? Um, and I decided to go off for 30 days. It was in the middle of nowhere and you're essentially stripped of everything, right? All of these credentials and achievements and every, you, you, we even had uniforms in that program, no material possessions, no technology, nothing. So a month in an ecosystem like that, that was focused on you know, taking you inward into understanding your mind was really sort of for me a transformational experience that then catalyzed a journey that led me to um, writing this book, um, which I have here. And I have um, copies for all of you, which I'll be happy to share. Um, I don't think we have a lot of time. I've probably taken up all of mine. So I'd love to spend a couple of minutes if we have time sharing with you, you know, what, um, what's in the book and how it has impacted people. But I've really realized and learned in the last couple of years just through this journey that sometimes, you know, changing someone's life, whether it's, you know, in terms of health and well-being or, you know, helping an entrepreneur become successful or helping an organization think differently is as simple as introducing them to a new way of thinking about things. And that's what I've been up to for the last few years. I know we've got a question here. I was going to say, uh, you went with yoga teacher, which was risky, because I would have gone with the, the fact that you are the inventor on nine patents. I don't think anybody here's got that, right? Anyway, I just thought I'd share that as an, something nobody else in the room has done either. Uh, so, but you had a question for Amita. I, it's actually a question for me. It's a question for all of you, because one of the things I find so frustrating about these events is we opine and we don't hear from you guys. So what, I'd like to ask you a question. You don't have to answer. I'm going to ask my esteemed colleagues to answer the question, see if that resonates with you. What are the characteristics of an entrepreneur's mind? Don't just think about it. I want these guys to answer the question. What are the hallmark characteristics? Um, and because I've got the microphone and I'm self-indulgent, I'm going to answer my own question. The three things, and they're, they're very, to me, they're very, um, they're in conflict. An entrepreneur, first and foremost, is, has the most amazing belief in themselves. They believe they can solve anything. They see um, a square garden, a robot garden. I could do that. Do I have any idea what mechanical engineering is? No, I don't, but I could do it. Second, they see things differently. They, they, when, they see a, when they see something frustrating, they, they, see a, they see a solution. They see a way to fix it. They also, and call it shout out to my friends here at Apple, they pick the right tool for the job. Now those wonderful skills have a downside. They can't see when it's not working because they get up every day, they brush themselves off because yesterday was horrible. Yesterday my venture fell apart, my money went away. Yesterday uh, that investment that was just amazing uh, or this product just doesn't work and they, yesterday I had cancer and I don't have it today, I'm gonna work it out. I will shake it off. Sometimes it's a bad idea 
and you know much how much time, no matter how pregnant you are with the idea, forgive the use of pregnancy, it's a bad idea. So as an entrepreneur, having answered my own question, have you know, know that if you're going to be an entrepreneur, if you're going to get out there, you're going to take a lot of risk, you can take a lot of risk on yourself, um, but also recognize sometimes your idea is just bad. And that's where someone like Accelerate DC will come along and say, we'll never tell you it's bad. We'd never say that. We might say something like, yeah, I might like to think about that just a little. But that's code. Uh, I'm, just gonna, uh, I'm really glad you said that, because uh, I was hearing you say fail fast, right? Like, no, when it's not working. Only way that I know to do that is to have a team of peers uh, that can support you. So I think advisors are great, but also having peer entrepreneurs that can say, yeah, you know, Tim, you're rocking and you're rolling and things are great, but what about this one thing? Because I'm the one who might call you out when somebody who's, you know, realize how, how, you know, reading the press reports won't do that, right? I mean, people who are your peers and crazy entrepreneurs, uh, I thought you did a pretty good job of uh, describing that. Uh, I always say find a way or make one, yep. right? Uh, a lot of those actually have parallels with the military, too. Uh, can do attitude, all that other good stuff. But I really like that, and I just thought you brought in the advisors for Accelerate DC, and I would say absolutely have advisors. Um, just like I always say, if you don't have an admin, you are one. If you don't have advisors, you don't have a mirror. Uh, if you don't have peers, you don't have a mirror. And eventually, you will make a mistake. Uh, so I wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, me too. Um, but I, I, I thought um, I'll throw it out to the crowd, because I think that's good. <clears throat> oh, yeah, OK. You guys want to answer what's an entrepreneur? If you don't, sure. Uh, I, I would tend to agree with the, uh, that, that assessment. I think that the two characteristics, the two defining characteristics of an entrepreneur is probably number one. Um, Sure, grit, that determination that when you know it's two in the morning uh, and you just don't know if you want to keep going or you know you're sort of in the pit of despair, some major customer uh, churned or you had a major executive leave the company, um, the ability to just just you know uh, be sad about it for thirty seconds and then realize that you got to sit there and create a decision tree about what next to do, um, and if you don't do that, you know. Um, just realizing that you really just have to sit there and, and close shop, right? So there's no failure is not an option from that perspective. But the other the other kind of opposing thing to that, right, is, is this concept of constantly learning um, and constantly trying to develop uh, as a as an entrepreneur. And um, it's tough, right? I mean, because every day you're you're learning. And I think one of the things that I um, uh, have tr really tried to hone in on is sort of this this uh, concept around uh, picking the right people and picking the right uh, employees in the company, right? And so um, there's always a, uh, an inherent uh, tension between, for instance, experience and uh, the amount of effort that somebody's willing to put in, right? So um, oftentimes you'll be faced with a, a hiring decision where you have somebody who is um, materially less experienced but has uh, a lot of grit and determination, um, whereas you know, that sort of person B is somebody who has a, a ton of experience uh, but um, uh, for whatever reason, uh, you know, is kind of checked out a little bit, it's a little bit more nine to five. And so um, one of the kind of philosophies that I found over time is that you want to find people whose career trajectories are exponential, right? People who are constantly learning, constantly developing, constantly failing. I mean, we actually mathematically graph out people's performance over time. At some point, the person who's performing on a linear basis over time um, will underperform the person who's continuously growing exponentially, um, even if you're willing to take that uh, bit of risk up front. So it's the same thing when it comes to an entrepreneur, right? You have to make that slope of your performance as steep as possible. Um, and in order to do that, you have to constantly be learning, constantly be developing, um, and try and make yourself better every day. So I'll, I'll answer the question, though, you know, that's... Um between the three of them, they've really covered, you know, a lot of the qualities. But I'll try to I'll answer the question in a much more systematic way, only because you know it's a lot of what I write about in here, and also um, it's you know I speak about it to entrepreneurs and have a lot of stories from you know how it's impacted um, how they think of 
entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurial mindset. I'll, I'll preface it by saying that, you know, the more time I have spent in this world of entrepreneurship and, you know, entrepreneurs and those who mentor them, the more convinced I am that, you know, it can be taught to a large extent. Um, you know, there are some of us who I think by virtue of circumstance or life are sort of thrust into it, but I think a lot of these qualities can actually be learned and harnessed very proactively. And I'll share with you very quickly. So what, what the book talks about, you know, a lot of my research from neuroscience and, you know, a lot of these other fields I looked at, business management, et cetera, these entrepreneurs I worked with, you know, essentially led me to um, converge on a very simple concept of the mind. Um, we tend to do when we're alert and awake, we typically tend to think in one of three states. Um, the first one is what I call the 1D mind, the one-dimensional mind. It's the survival mind. It's fight or flight. Um, very impulsive, very quick thinking, and a lot of it is shaped by our early experiences and emotions. Um, that's the state of mind where fear resides. Um, so incredibly useful when you have a real threat or danger in life, but incredibly unhelpful when you are afraid of failure or you're afraid of change, or you don't want to get out of your comfort zone, you don't want to quit that job to start a company. You know, a lot of these um, behaviors and tendencies that we experience can typically be traced to when you really sit down with them to some sort of fear. And sometimes those fears are very subtle, but I think a lot, I, I would say, um, you know, all great entrepreneurs are cognizant of their fears and have conquered a lot of those weaknesses and those fundamental fears. So the reason they have grit is because fear doesn't paralyze them. They, it might be there, it might you know, be in their awareness, but it doesn't paralyze them to the level of inaction or you know, taking the wrong action in a moment of impulse. Um, so that's one. The second state of mind is the rational, analytical, logical mind. I think all of us in this room have probably honed that to perfection. It's the one that schooling really trains and encourages. In my venture capital job, it was you know, the state of mind I relied on a lot um, to do data and analysis. But again, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, you're first and foremost a change agent. And when you're trying to change the world, you don't know what the future looks like. And often it doesn't even exist yet. You can't model it. You know, you, data and analytics will only take you so far and often they lead to analysis paralysis or um, you know, to the wrong answers. Um, so I think great entrepreneurs are very agile and facile with using data, using it well, using the right data, and discriminating between you know, data and analyses that serve them and those that don't. And they have this capacity to walk away from the information when it doesn't serve them any longer. So I've noticed this, you know, there's this incredible ab ability to discriminate in terms of the types of analyses that do and the types of information that you, you know, let inform your decisions and dismiss as not being useful. Um, and the state of mind that you use to then solve problems often is what I call the 3D mind. So the 3D mind, you know, I compare to sort of, it's, it's the big picture perspective. It's, it's the intuitive mind. Um, it's the state of mind where our passion comes from. It's, you know, when you have this deep sense of meaning and purpose and you're engaged in something, you know, athletes call it the zone, artists call it a state of flow. That's the state of mind that I think a lot of great entrepreneurs have harnessed as well. Um, a lot of the great investors I interacted with had a very good intuition, you know, about, I think this person in this market can really transform things. And they learn to trust that intuition. And that's actually something that you can proactively harness and build up over time. And I think great entrepreneurs, you know, have this incredible sense of clarity. It's a, it's a combination of passion and purpose. You know, they believe in it, but they're not blinded. You know, they'll drink their own Kool-Aid, but they also know when to stop and sort of delve into the rational analytical mind. And um, when they're able to sort of harness the strengths of all three states of mind, when anyone, you know, whether you're an entrepreneur, an innovator, a leader, you know, I was recently talking to a group of physicians who are struggling with, you know, how do we transform healthcare? I've been speaking with inner city school children who just struggle with, you know, how do you navigate teenage life? And really in, in any of these situations, when you, when you know that you have these three states of mind in you and you can access them, it can be really transformational in how you approach life. Yeah, you know, I, I will throw it out there. Let me just do a time check because uh, we want to make sure we get people out of here relatively on time. But we've got 15 minutes because so we have plenty of time, which is great. Um, so I, maybe what I'll do is I'll recap, but you, I want you guys to be ready to, to jump in. I'll just recap some of the takeaways that I heard um, in terms of, you know, everyone who, in the room here is an entrepreneur. Uh, what I heard brought up was culture, focus on having a great culture in the company. 
think big. I, that's because I said it. Um, uh, Pip, confidence in yourself. Yeah, uh, not too much confidence, but uh, yeah, definitely. And then uh, pivot even if it's successful. Like always, be evaluating uh, while you're having success. And I'll throw in the advisors and peer group because they can also check you, check yourself before you wreck yourself if you've got friends like that. Um, and then I heard, Amita, you said a lot of really good stuff, so I didn't quite capture all of it. Um, but managing the mental and physical health and diet as well as the entrepreneur mind, I, I really think that's worth studying uh, because you need to invest in yourselves as entrepreneurs uh, or somebody's going to blow by you soon, right? I mean, heck, I, I spent 10 years, what, what Tim spent about you know 180 days doing. Um, so I'll throw that out there. Uh, who's got questions, crises? There's a lot of war stories I know that I have I didn't talk about. You guys have several. So uh, just throw them out there. We'll jot them down, and then we'll answer as many as we can. Steve. Uh, Hi, I'm Steve Seiden. I uh, have a company called Acquired Data Solutions. We've been in business for 18 years. I know Mike for a long time. Um, in a world where everybody gets a trophy, how do we teach them how to fail forward? Because you talk about failure, but failure is not failure if you're failing forward. So the question is, I've heard a lot of culture, this, you know, great things, but what's the, what's the how? How do you do it? What's the roadmap? You know, they're all just words. And, and the question is, how do, you, how do you teach somebody in a world where we all get a trophy in today's world, to permission to fail and how to fail forward? I think that's a great question. If you don't mind, Steve, what, what I'm going to do is let's, let's keep getting the questions. Yeah. We'll, we'll get about you know, five or ten out there until we start getting nervous about not knowing the answers, uh, and then we'll start answering them. <laughs> no, we're good. We, we, we've gone this far. Okay. Thank you, panel. Outstanding discussion. Impressive. My question is, uh, what made D.C. one of the uh, best city for entrepreneur? Is it, is it support from the uh, government? Business community, nonprofit community, and so forth, or is it all the above? And also, is it like uh, support from the neighborhoods and, and and others? That's my question. That's a good question. I, I, I think that's that's also the, the folks here at D, WDC EDP <laughs> be happy to have us answer that. We've got some thoughts. Yep. Uh, you just mentioned this about not only the uh, the answers. It seems to be that tolerance for ambiguity is one of the hallmarks of entrepreneurs. And you all give examples from your own experience. Couldn't sleep without it. <laughs> so uh, how can you, how could one um, help, say, young people understand that that's part of, how can we, how can we learn that rather than just being born that way? That's a great question. So uh, a tolerance for amb ambiguity, how do we teach that or inculcate that without, uh, well, I'll just stop there. That's a good question. Let's get a few more. Uh, yes, good evening. Excellent remarks uh, from all the presenters. Thank you for, for coming and, and sharing your experiences and knowledge with us. Um, Amita, one, one thing you um, spoke to um, was this concept of, of, of failure. And we even heard failure fast, um, you know, that buzz phraseology. Um, and, and, and you even cited, I guess, in your experience uh, in the venture cap world, uh, that more of the failures came as a result of the management team uh, chemistry. Um, um, did you see that disproportionately in the healthcare sector uh, per se, or do you see that across uh, all sectors? Um, uh, and when you talk about failing fast, um, does that, um, that management chemistry lend itself to failing fast because personalities surface at different times. Uh, you may not know that you just don't have the optimal mix of, of, of people running, running the business and senior management until, you know, that point in time, which is too far off in the, in the future. But, but thank you. Since he was addressing it to you, I'm going to let you recap that before we start answering him. <laughs> Some other questions? We've got one up front. Well, um, like you, Mike, I was in a very similar situation where I was uh, diagnosed with throat cancer about uh, four and a half years ago. And uh, while in the actual cancer chair, I, I actually thought of a, a solution that I saw uh, this thing transpiring around me. And uh, so, uh, 
four kids in college, I had to make some, 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 some decisions at that particular state. However, um, now that I have the solution actually developed and the kids are on the other side, my main focus right now is to be able to build traction. And uh, so my question to you is, how do you build that traction when you're at that customer ready to go in uh, and step out there? But you've got a great voice too for beating throat cancer. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty good. So I, I, I've got that. I mean, you've got a, a solution to some type of cancer or, or, or how it's treated. Okay, so uh, healthcare solution ideas on getting traction. That's that's what I wrote down. Thank you. Maybe we'll start at your end, Mita. Uh, fell forward. Steve brought up a question about how to uh, how to teach people to fell forward, and I got to tell you, that's when you were describing all the abilities of an entrepreneur and all the traits and techniques that an entrepreneur follows and they could be taught. I'd have to think about it a long time to really fully agree, but I am I'm inclined to agree. So somebody knows how to do paragliding, how to improvise a, a, a parachute, they're on the edge of the cliff. The one question I've got is, can, you get, can we train them to jump, right? Because we've all jumped and started assembling the airplane on the way down. So I'm curious about your thoughts and then we'll, we'll bounce this way. Sure. Um, so. I have a lot of thoughts on this one, so I'll try and keep it um, compressed, but happy to chat with any of you afterwards and, you know, happy to share more stories as well. So, you know, in terms of um, the trainability of the mind, I, I think there are a few elements to it, and that really is a much longer conversation. You know, I think the younger you are, um, the easier it is. So, I, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. I think, you know, if you, when, you, when you're able to teach these qualities to children, you know, not to fear failure, not to see it as sort of this, you know, disastrous consequence of a mistake made. You know, when you reframe how you look at failure, um, that impacts um, your entire life. So I think often it is easier. I have found, you know, the youngest group I have worked with is middle school students, and I have to say middle schoolers are still developing neurologically, so a very challenging group, and you have to be really creative. But when I talk to high school students, um, it's incredibly powerful because, you know, w one session I did, um, it was actually inner city kids here in Washington, D.C., um, you know, sometimes when you're facing a lot of problems, especially at such a young age, you feel overwhelmed by them, and I think it can happen to anyone, and these kids just, you know, couldn't see a way out of their problems beyond their problems, and they started to identify with their problems to, ex to a level where the problems define them. So, you know, the 1D mind and fear was just dominating them, so I think you can very much train people to, you know, um, reduce the impact of that mind. And there, you know, the fields of mindfulness, and there is a lot of medical clinical research actually now being done on how mindfulness reduces the effect of the amygdala, which is where a lot of our sort of innate fear responses reside. So there is actually clinical scientific evidence that suggests as you train the mind to get out of that state, the mind becomes better at getting out of that state. So it's plasticity, the mind can change itself. Um, so, you know, for, in terms of, you know, I, adult entrepreneurs, people like us in this room, you know, another very important element and dimension that I have discovered is, you know, the, we all have the capacity to transform ourselves, but you have to have the desire to transform yourself. And that has to be, you know, a pretty deep fundamental desire. And that goes to anything we try and change in life. You know, January 1st is always a day when all of us decide to change many things about our lives. And most of us fail, but, but some of us succeed, and, some, and so, some of us succeed at some things and fail at other things. And, you know, I've spent a lot of time talking to groups about this and also, you know, looking at the research behind this. When you're, when you're really committed to doing something, you know, when it's at the level of the 3D mind, which is at the level where a passionate entrepreneur operates, you'll find a way to make it happen. You know, those failures don't hold you back. You, you find a way. Sometimes, you know, we undertake things in life and sometimes a job might be something like that where you're not really committed and passionate. So then, you know, a crisis comes up or it might be a startup idea you're not really committed to and then a crisis comes up and you're like, well, that's not gonna work. And you dismiss it and you walk away from it. Someone else who's more passionate about the exact same idea will find a way to drive it to success. So I think it's, it's, it's that second dimension that matters almost as much. And, and here's the crazy thing, you know, I was having this conversation with a physician the other day and he was saying, well, you know, there are these, those minds, those creatives. And I said to him, you know, this is, this is metacognition really. Um, if you think, you know, 
An old dog can learn new tricks, but the old dog has to believe that it can. And if the old dog thinks that it can't learn new tricks, then it certainly can't. So, you know, that's metacognition. It's changing how you think about things. And I think when we approach it at the level of metacognition and when you have someone who is deeply committed to change, you know, there are lots of stories in this world of people doing incredible things. Um, so I, I do believe it. Uh, on the issue of failure, uh, I mean, I think, you know, you can't, you can't divorce these questions from the question of, like, accountability, right, on a day-to-day -day operational level. And so um, one of the things that I think is really important, uh, particularly for our executive team, is to think about um, goal setting and uh, how you drive accountability through the organization. Uh, particularly, I think, uh, a lot of the accountability tends to fall apart um, as you scale up the organization at that sort of middle management layer. Um, and so one of the things I think a lot about just operationally is just uh, among the managers that I'm one step removed from, how do you continue to drive accountability um, and continue to keep a culture of failure? Um, and so the first step is just you have to have goals, right? I mean, you have to have some level of accountability to know if you failed or not. Um, but the second step is, you know, I think uh, really kind of trying to create uh, an organization where failure is tolerated for the right reasons, um, and then really trying to inculcate and proceduralize ways in which you're constantly learning from those failures. And so one of the things we do at our organization is, um, uh, you know, we, we hold regular post-mortems, right? So a post-mortem is when uh, you set a goal, you know, your manager or your department or whatever the case is doesn't hit that goal, project is delayed, sales uh, targets aren't met, or whatever the case is, you sit down with the team, you have a very honest and candid discussion of why do we fail, um, what can we take from this uh, as an organization, and how do we move forward and make sure that we don't do it again. Um, doing that over and over and over again um, in your management teams, in your executive teams, in your, um, you know, just your project teams, kind of builds that culture from the ground up and making sure that people feel like um, they can take those risks, they can, um, uh, they can, you know, achieve a lot more. Um, you know, there, there are two really great books that, that I force all of our managers across the company to read. Uh, so the first book is uh, How High Output Management by Andy Grove. Great, great book about just operational ways of managing a company. Uh, the second book is uh, Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And so somebody asked about, um, you know, yeah, Pat Lachoni, uh, you know, uh, what, what makes management teams fail? Um, you know, there's a lot of different things, but, you know, in the book it talks a lot about lack of trust, lack of accountability, lack of um, you know, uh, direction and alignment. Um, these, I think, uh, for us, uh, are sort of like the Bibles in terms of like just making sure that you know, we're running an organ a very, very effective, very, very systematic organization in the company. Um, and the last question that I, I think um, you know, that I can uh, possibly speak to is probably the, just the, the sort of differences between uh, San Francisco, Bay Area tech culture and, and DC tech culture. Um, so in many ways, DC tech culture is very, very, it's still very nascent, right? It's, um, and I think um, uh, there, there are lots of pluses and minuses in, in both districts and, and organizations, or in, in geographies. Um, the Bay Area, you know, what it really has going for it, apart from the sort of uh, affinity to capital, um, is really just walk, being able to walk down the street and being able to talk to an entrepreneur, talk to an angel investor, bump into somebody at a Starbucks and just chat about um, some idea that you're working on. Um, now, I'm not saying that that's not available in Washington, um, and I think there are you know, great forums like this and like others and uh, around the city that are trying to create those types of environments, but that's really what it comes down to, right? Because one of the things that, um, uh, that I've, I've been told cons consistently by a lot of my mentors and advisors is that um, you are essentially the average of the five people that you associate yourself with the most, right? And so what ends up happening is that you want to try and find people that are going through the same problems that you can empathize with, that you can actually um, talk about, uh, you know, crazy, you know, off the wall solutions and not be uh, considered, uh, you know, uh, you know, crazy, um, but really thinking about, um, you know, what's next, right? And um, in many ways, I think there, there's, Washington is interesting because it's sort of getting to this critical mass where there are uh, enough people that are thinking about these problems, they're thinking of very large scale problems. Um, and that's actually one of the biggest um, pluses for Washington is that people think really big here, right? I mean, when people think about problems, they think about, you know, global poverty, they think, think about, um, you, know, you know, global water shortages, they think about infrastructure, they think about education. Um, 
the reality is that in Silicon Valley, the majority of entrepreneurs, and I, I don't say this super derogatorily, but the majority of entrepreneurs think about how to build the next food delivery app um, or how to solve some minuscule problem that most uh, affluent millennials have uh, in, in inner cities. So I think that um, that's actually a major advantage uh, in Washington in that that sort of big thinking um, is, is very, very large. And I think the more environments where we can create um, venues where these, these large thinkers are paired together with um, uh, innovators, right? People who have real solutions that are thinking about the technology and solution side of things. Um, there's major, major advances that we can make, right? And everything from government to infrastructure to education, healthcare. The, the the talent is here, the passion is here. It's just a matter of kind of getting everybody in the same room um, and getting them to kind of talk to each other. I'm going to give Mike the last word but I do want to say 30 seconds. First of all, I won't be offended that a company that's trying to change how people use water is Silicon Valley based, and uh, I won't in any way be hurt by what you said because you're absolutely right. Second, I'm gonna, I've learned a huge amount from you two. I would have said, and I'm gonna say it because I, I'm not 100% convinced, entrepreneurs are born, they're not made. If you are an entrepreneur, you can be trained to be a better entrepreneur, but if you have to be wanting to take that risk, you have to want to do it and that's something that's born not made although I would have to profess I'm revisiting that as I listen to the two of you um, so I want to congratulate you all for being here and being entrepreneurs and with that final word I want to give it to the man to my left thanks um, you know I would have answered the same way you would have to that um, I was really trying to uh, come up with I forget who ever asked the question about can you have the tolerance for ambig ambiguity I think it was over here and the idea of how to teach failing forward and being an entrepreneur. You know, I, I was really, and I've talked and worked with a lot of entrepreneurs in that 10 years in the, in the, in the uh, wilderness. Um, I th maybe the key is having something that you really totally rely on utterly let you down at some point in your life, right? I mean, I haven't always asked that question to a lot of entrepreneurs, but I'm thinking about most of the ones I know, and I know this one right here. There was something in your life, something in my life where, you know, your parents got divorced or something you were totally counting on that just falls apart, uh, where you have to find a way to jump off that cliff or else. I think if that, if that happens, I think that's when the entrepreneur is born, maybe. But my bias was your answer initially. So, uh, and, and I'm going I'm to wrap, but I think also the demographics drive. I mean, we're launching uh, our CrowdCrop app in D.C. in 2016. I think the gentleman in the back was asking about D.C. Uh, honestly, I think demographics drive it. Six of the ten richest counties in America are within 20 miles of D.C. Uh, I think the orders of magnitude of the appeal of a city where somebody goes is driven by those demographics as they relate to your company or your model. Uh, I think having great people like Accelerate D.C. Can, can tweak it, make it twice as good or three times as good. But if you want to go 20 times as good, it's got to be the demographics that drive it. That's just my take. I mean, um, Austin and San Francisco are on our target list, but they're like our two or three audiences because D.C. has got a lot of dual income, people who want to save the world, want to be a part of it, uh, and they're also affluent. So we've got a few other questions that I really want to get to. We don't have any time. Uh, I'm a fan of getting us out of here on time, or within five minutes at least. Um, and we do have drinks. I'm going to stick around. Are you guys going to stick around? You're going you're to stick around and sign books. You've, you're giving to everybody too, right? Uh, and I think the Accelerate DC folks will stick around too. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, there's, we didn't really talk about the, the cancer traction. You got my time as long as you want it, uh, of course. And I think you probably want to meet his uh, time more than anybody. But uh, thanks so much, guys. Uh, we'll stick around and answer other questions if you want them. But uh, special thanks to Dan, Tiffany, and Erica. You made this all happen. You got us out here when we all have lots of competing. Everybody in this room has got competing priorities. So really a tip of the hat uh, to all you guys. And thanks for everything you did. Thank you.